This week, we enter into the season of Advent as we look to the story of Jesus' birth from Zechariah's perspective. As you hear the text read aloud, listen for the hope Christ was for Zechariah, who is John the Baptist's father. Luke, chapter 1, 67 to 79, page 54 in your Bibles. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Holy words for God's people. Would you pray with me, please? Creator God, how good and perfect it is when your people gather in your holy and powerful name. We come before you this morning in the midst of a broken world, a world yearning for your love and desperate for your healing. And yet we come before you this morning trusting in the hope that you give. We come before you this morning living with the hope made known in Jesus, called to go out into the world anointed with your love. And so grant us your wisdom, your patience, your mercy, and most of all, grant us your spirit that we would be guided by you and you alone. Be present, O oh God. Move in this place that we too would be moved and changed. Speak to us, we pray. Less of me, more of you, none of me, all of you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember I was entering into my final semester of college at the University of Michigan. I was sitting with my academic advisor trying to map out a way for me to graduate on time. <laughs> Y'all laughed a little too hard on that one. <laughs> you see, I had already declared political science and English as my majors, and I had focused so much on fulfilling those requirements that I lost sight of the general requirements that I would need to take in order to graduate with a degree. And so there we were, looking through the natural science courses in the course catalog. Biology, nope. Chemistry, nope. Physics, nope. Earthquakes and the volcanoes, I already took that one. <laughs> My options were clearly limited, and so I enrolled in extreme weather. <laughs> real class, real story. I chose this not because of any particular desire to increase my knowledge in these natural phenomena, but rather I have heard that all the athletes took that course. <laughs> and so in other words, it had this reputation for being an easy class. 
But little did I know, the professor had changed between semesters, and so when I walked into class that first day, there were still a hundred of us in the lecture hall, but none of us were athletes. And almost immediately, my expectations for the course had changed. Have you ever heard the phrase, C's get degrees? (laughs) This morning... We enter into the season we call Advent, which comes from this Latin word meaning coming. It's a time for us to prepare for, to anticipate for, and to expect the coming of Jesus. But I wonder, what does that mean for us today in our day and age? What does it mean for this coming of Jesus? What are our expectations as we remember that day 2,000 years ago and how we apply that today. You see, eight years ago, our, our leadership then uh, gathered and they adopted a purpose statement, and you'll see it all over the place. It's in your bulletins and on different signs. It's becoming Christ in the community. And we've held on to that purpose for the last eight years as our programs and our ministries continue to grow and evolve and shape who we are today. But that Christ, that Christ in the community, Christ can mean and does mean something different to everyone. Right? Scripture is full of stories as Christ as a healer, or a feeder, or a comforter, or a teacher, and on and on. So for these next few weeks, as we journey through the season of Advent together, what we'll do is we'll take these weekly themes of Advent. We have hope, peace, joy, and love. And we'll focus on each one of those and see how the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago was the embodiment of those specific themes. So Christ as hope, and Christ as peace, and Christ as joy, and Christ as love. And we'll continue to look at how this informs our purpose today. When we say becoming Christ in the community, what might that mean? And so today, we we start with hope, becoming hope. Now, this text that we heard Dick read for us this morning is, is the beautiful culmination of a portion of Christ's birth narrative. Earlier in chapter 1, we, we read about Zechariah, a priest who was righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments. And he and his wife, Elizabeth, were getting on in their years. They were getting old, and they had no children because Scripture tells us Elizabeth was barren. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, it's because this theme of God providing in the midst of barrenness occurs over and over throughout Scripture, especially the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. We look at Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, Manoah and his wife who were the parents of Samson. We have Elkanah and Hannah, the parents of Samuel, and on and on. And so from the beginning already, the beginning of our introduction to these two characters, to Zechariah and to Elizabeth, our author is setting us up to think back to and to draw upon the Hebrew scriptures. And in doing so, the author reminds us of Jewish history. You see, from the days of the prophet Samuel, there was this event There was an event predicted by prophets and anticipated by all the people, an event that would deliver Israel from all its enemies. King David sang about the coming of Messiah in the Psalms. Isaiah wrote poetry about a savior, a a prince of peace. Jeremiah preached in the streets about a righteous branch that would sprout from David's line. The Israelites have been waiting for centuries for this powerful liberator, this redeemer, this healer, this deliverer. And they anticipated, they waited for, they expected and prepared for a sign from God. This tradition, this anticipation is real for Zechariah personally too as he fulfills his duties as a priest in the temple. 
See, what would happen is that all the priests would be divided into 24 different groups, and each group would serve twice a year for a whole week offering incense and sacrifices in the temple. And there was a list that they would compile within each group of those who did not make it or have not been in the temple before, and the lots were then cast. And this privilege, this often once-in-a-lifetime privilege, would be given to a priest who would go and care for the altar while all the other priests were gathered outside waiting in prayer. And scripture tells us that as Zechariah was performing his duties, the angel of the Lord encounters him and tells him that his prayers have been heard, that he and Elizabeth will have a son and they will name him John. Now this person will later go on to be more commonly known as John the Baptist, preaching and teaching in preparation of Jesus' ministry. But in the meantime, he is simply an answer to a parent's prayer. Unfortunately, this does not seem possible for Zechariah. Zechariah reminds the angel that both he and Elizabeth are old. And then the angel turns and reminds him that he is an angel and that he speaks for God. (laughs) And because of Zechariah's unwillingness to believe, inability to believe in his lack of faith, he loses his ability to speak until that day when all is fulfilled. And then 30 or so verses later, John is born and Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit as he sings this beautiful song of praise to God, speaking about Jesus, the Christ to come. Hear these words again. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us. He has shown mercy to our ancestors. He has remembered his covenants. He has rescued us that we might serve him. Salvation comes. These words of gratitude, of praise. Theologian Luke Timothy Johnson writes that this song of Zechariah gives the reader the first sure sense of what liberation means for Luke, for the author of our gospel. See, it's defined in specifically religious rather than political terms. See, one way of looking at it, freedom means release from the power of enemies. But in this case, the positive side is worship. Liberation means worship and holiness of life. The Messiah's role is not one of violent revolt, but rather of leading the people in the path of peace. I wonder if we, like Luke's first century audience, might look at the hope Christ brings as a fulfillment of God's promise and an invitation into the wholeness of life, into the holiness of life. (laughs) Because I'm struck, I'm struck by the brokenness that exists in our world today, the disharmony with the earth, the rifts that threaten to divide families and split relationships, the blatant struggle for power, for control, for more and more and more at the expense of others, the oppression and marginalization that happens in front of our very eyes. I'm struck by the increases in homelessness, in depression, in addiction, in violence, in war, in language of hate, in fear of the other, and on and on. But it's in those moments that I recognize my own brokenness and my need to lean on God's promise, on God's faithfulness, and to carry this forward. There's a specific moment when that same realization, I think, happens for Zechariah. It happens a few verses before our text in verses 59 and 60. You see, Zechariah and Elizabeth's son is born. 
And as is custom of the time, eight days later, he is brought to the temple to be circumcised. And as it is still custom to the time, the family, because Zechariah can't speak yet, decides to name him after the father, Zechariah. But Elizabeth stops them. And Elizabeth remembers the words of the angel and says, No, he is to be called John. And the people are confused. There's nobody named John in your family. Why, John? And they turn to Zechariah, who still can't speak. Bring him a tablet. And he writes, His name is John. This is cool. The name Zechariah means God has remembered. The name John means God is gracious. Did you hear that verb? You see, as much as we trust in God's promise, as much as we trust in God's faithfulness, as much as we put our hope for healing and wholeness with the past, confessing that God has remembered throughout time, we must also put our hope in the active work that God is doing even today. Amen, somebody. Amen. Some, no, not that part. Oh. <laughs> God has remembered. God is gracious even today, even to you and to me now. What a privilege. What a joy. What an honor it is to be invited to join in that active, that active, that continuing work, God's active, continuing work, not out of ritual or habit or tradition or Christian obligation, but because we too, because you too, have a hope for the world to be shared far from here. That's good news. That's a hope that we can trust in that we can wait for, that we can actively pursue even today. And so may we live into our purpose, our purpose of becoming Christ in the community, and may we live into becoming hope. And may it be the kind of hope that offers wholeness and holiness, that offers life, relationship, that offers love, and joy to one another, to the community, and to all the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And so, God, we come before you trusting and remembering the ways that you have walked before us, the ways that you have walked with our foremothers and forefathers, the ways that you have been faithful before now, and we trust in the promise that you continue to be active in our world, driving us towards a vision of your beloved community. Make us bold and strong that even in our times of waiting that we might trust in you and be that hope for the world. For it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen.